With all the new technology and the abundance of information on the web, you would think that buying or selling or understanding the real estate market would be easier than ever. But ask yourself one question. Now that you've done your homework and you think you know what's going on, what do you do next? What do you do next? Welcome everyone. It is 10 o'clock on Tuesday and I screwed up my icons or my chirons there a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, I had a phone call five seconds before I went on the air and tried to come on very quickly. Uh, good morning everyone. It's time for talk about what do you do next and uh, let me get my act together here. Uh, my name is Stuart Fournier. I am a residential realtor here in Manhattan Beach, California. My wife and I, Randy, we uh, service the LA Basin area. We've had listings all the way from Mulholland down to actually Surfside and all in between. Um, we've represented a lot, a lot of territory. We're a little unique in that regard because uh, we uh, work areas outside of our living area where we primarily practice and one of the reasons we can do that is our background which I won't get into uh, but we really do have a great deal of knowledge about all of the Los Angeles area and are happy to share that with you at any time don't want to get up on too much of a tangent there but uh, just want to give you a scope of our experience we've been practicing uh, for well over between the two of us 35 plus years um, and have an awful lot of knowledge about all aspects of real estate um, we, we've done short sales, we've done 1031 exchanges, we've done income properties, uh, we've done new bills, uh, we've done uh, flippers, we've done pretty much all of it in our years and years of experience. So we decided to create this website, <coughs> excuse me, this blog rather, to talk about our experiences and to talk about how we can actually help you in strategizing the process to make um, the transaction of a real estate uh, situation a lot easier. <clears throat> so with that, let's get started. Today's subject, what we do is we take about 5 to 15 minutes uh, every Tuesday at 10 o'clock and we tear apart something that may be a little obscure to you. Maybe you've heard uh, in the past uh, a term that, you know, didn't make a whole lot of sense to you and you're afraid to ask. That's the kind of thing that we like to do here. And we are Facebook Live. I am encouraging you to please ask a question if you like uh, during the broadcast. Um, let me, and I'm going to entice you to ask a question because the idea of this blog is to not only educate you, but also to get you involved and answer any questions that we can. It doesn't have to be related to today's subject. It can be just to be uh, just about anything whether it's the market, whether it's your particular market, which I have a great deal of knowledge of. Again, all of Los Angeles, I'm happy to comment. Uh, I've surprised quite a few people with my <laughs> breadth of knowledge. I was involved in a business that allowed me to have that kind of base of knowledge. So please feel free to ask me about your particular neighborhood and the status of the market. But again, today, I'm, I'm getting off track a little bit. Uh, today, we're going to talk about two terms that you've probably heard but many, many times maybe don't have a complete grasp of, and those two terms are escrow and title. Now, escrow and title, like many other terms in real estate, have very deep uh, roots in the process by which they're involved in a transaction and also uh, the importance uh, to be involved in transactions. So we're going to tear that apart just a little bit today to give you a sense of what that is. Uh, again, please feel free to ask a question while, while I'm a uh, nice, real big itch on top of my head <laughs> uh, while we get started. And in the video uh, on the beach, one of the things I continue to say, and that's obviously a taped uh, intro that I use for not only this particular blog, but also for my website as well, is I go on to say that there's actually 14 different industries that'll be involved in your transaction. That is to say 14 to possibly more separate industries that'll be involved in your transaction. You know, I mentioned this before, you're going to sign your name approximately 75 to 80 times 
uh, during your transaction. And it's so unfair for us to assume that, quite frankly, you're going to understand all the concepts and the contractual obligations that you're making um, in a such short period of time for so many different industries. And so, again, that's one of the reasons we do this program is to focus on a little bit of it each week. Now, here's, uh, I'm going to break into escrow first. And I usually have this memorized at the top of my head, but because Facebook Live sometimes can be a little intimidating, I want to make sure I don't miss any of the industries that are involved. Now, these are the 14 different industries that are involved during your transaction. You have the loan company, you have the escrow company, you have the appraiser, you have the inspector, you have the title company, you have a termite company, you have the city and county, and within the city and county you can have different organizations, whether it's the actual city you're in or the county you're in, or of course maybe even the IRS as well. That's just a, a category that has subcategories. Um, you have the seller's uh, bank. In other words, when you're buying a house, the seller's bank has to be involved and coordinate through escrow as to where uh, payoffs or the actual transfer of money is going to happen. Uh, you have a natural hazards uh, disclosure company. Uh, you have um, the brokers, of course, involved. That's two more companies. Uh, you have the repair, the contractors, uh, the people that are going to come out and give you second opinions based upon what happens in your inspection. Uh, you have the insurance company. You potentially have an HOA if you're buying a townhouse or a condominium. Uh, you have the home warranty company. Those are the 14. Now, those are not even in, uh, don't even include your professional services. Um, now, your professional services like um, your uh, attorneys, uh, CPAs, uh, your financial managers, uh, your life insurance, all those uh, professions can become involved in your transaction as well. Now, I list the last ones because they are always not necessary in order for you to close your house or buy a house, but uh, they can certainly play an important role if you have any uh, interface in terms of problems respective of how your transaction is going. So as you can see, there are a multitude of industries. There's a multitude of, of uh, 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 transactional details that have to be taken care of. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of people um, that, I'm sorry, not hundreds of people, but hundreds of details wherein dozens of people can be involved in your transaction. Uh, it's been said that potentially 35 people actually will have your transaction come across their desk. So I say all this not because I'm trying to scare you into buying a house. Actually, there is this whole process is extremely well orchestrated by professionals that know how to make it easy for you vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, representation and, and, and such. Now, one thing I want to give you a little bit of tip uh, to talk about is this. You know, for those of you that have bought or sold a house before, uh, it's understandably pretty aggravating to see that list at the end that shows you everything that you've paid for. It gets to be kind of, you know, overwhelming to be able to understand all the charges and all the people that have charged you for your transaction. But here's one thing I wanted to give you in terms of a tip. You know, many times I tell my clients, you know, you're paying for an inspector, you're paying for escrow, you are paying for your title company, you're paying for your termite. Treat those people as you would any other vendor. In other words, what I'm saying is you have the right to talk to those vendors directly. Very few people, for example, talk to their title rep. And title reps are more than willing to talk to uh, the people that they charge for the services that they do. Same thing with escrow. You know, I've always found that many of these services are actually begging for customers to call them because they want to show that they want to be cooperative, they want to be thorough. They want to show what their profession is all about and how they can help you. So take two things into consideration. Number one, you are actually paying them. And if you pay them at the end and you haven't used their services, it's kind of, you know, you kind of have a missed opportunity. So if you have any questions, always feel free to call the services that have been mentioned 
during your transaction. Now, admittedly, you should be able to go to your realtor first and have your realtor sort of be the filter for whatever your question is. But many, many times, realtors, if they're responsible enough, will say, you know, if you want a more detailed answer about the service that you're using, give them a call. You're paying them. And I always encourage my clients to do that. Now, realtors, through experience, of course, have a lot of answers prior to them having to call. And sometimes it satisfies and sometimes it doesn't. But I've always thought it was a very a smart thing to do for buyers or sellers to call their services. And I'll leave that where it is. So as I mentioned, all these 14 different services, how do they coordinate? How do they talk to one another? How do they fulfill the obligations of the contract? And that is what escrow is all about. If you t t take into consideration, once again, how large that contract is, those 10 to 12 pages that I've talked about many, many times before on this blog, what is inside of them? Who's going to coordinate that? Who's going to make sure that the uh, steps that have been said to have wanted to be taken or contractually obligated to be taken are going to happen? And so there needs to be one company that kind of coordinates, I just shouldn't say kind of, that does coordinate all of those multitude of steps, and that's what escrow is. Now, one of the most important things to understand about escrow is although they are, in essence, kind of a oversight, maybe even referred to as a referee, they actually do not have any powers, for example, to, in a referee uh, type description, to give penalties. In other words, we in within the contract, both sides agree for everything to be done at this particular company, your escrow company. But the escrow company, excuse me, the escrow company can only forward the information of the contract, not interpret it in any way, or not penalize you in any way, or not show any prejudice in any way with respect to the process. Now, I know that sounds very complicated, but actually it's a very important point to understand. And this is the reason why. The reason why is that within the contract, both sides have agreed while you're in escrow not to change anything about the contract itself. In other words, not to change any of the steps that are going to be forwarding during the th process, respective of all these industries yeah, my cheat sheet, okay. Uh, respective of all these industries, um, unless both sides once again agree that that can happen. So let me clarify just a little bit. The two of you have something in the contract that you want to change, or one person wants to change and another person doesn't. So let's take those two examples. When the two of you want to make a change to the contract, okay, you both I got to get rid of that habit of saying, okay, I don't like that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, when the two of you uh, decide there's going to be a change, you both have to contractually make an addendum to the contract that says you both agree to make that change. So in other words, you cannot, nor can the other side, whether it's a buyer or seller, make changes unilaterally. You just can't come into the contract and decide, no, I want to change this. You have to have the permission of the other side. And that's a real important point. Now, escrow, for example, if they were to receive information from one side where they are going to try to change it, and that pers person finds out uh, that they can't make a change, uh, escrow will actually stop the process. They can't penalize anyone. They're not going to find fault with, an, with anything that someone does, but they can stop the process. And we've seen that happen many, many times when one side is becoming very unreasonable and is not following the contract. So that's just a, one example of how escrow actually is taking care of the process. They're not taking care of you. They're taking care of the process itself. I'm not going to get into uh, much more detail about escrow because it does become very complicated. But the one thing that you should know about escrow that's extremely important and that we all kind of take for granted is, you know, uh, who gets the money? How do they get the money? How do you verify the money is coming in? Where's the actual transfer? How do I know I actually own the home? All these things escrow is looking out for 
uh, and looking out for it in order to advise you if there's any problems along the way. And here's the most important thing. When, unlike almost any other purchase, when title, and I'm going to talk about title in just a second here, when title passes, that is to say that you give the rights of your property to someone else, and it's recorded at the LA County Recorder's Office or a recorder's office um, anywhere in the country, that process is over. There are no do-overs in real estate. You cannot, for example, if there was a mistake or even if there was fraud or anything, get your house back. And that's pretty scary. So that's why the process is so involved, so technical, so legal, because everyone's protecting the process. Because once title passes, it's done. It cannot be reversed. You cannot have a do-over. Do now, that's a broad statement, and I don't want to get myself in legal trouble, because there are all kinds of uh, factors that can go into whether some, something's been done fraudulently or something's been done uh, illegally. But the bottom line is, is that once title passes, it cannot be redone. And that's why escrow actually was developed many decades, if not almost a century ago, to protect that process. Now, that leads into what title is. Now, title is very simply the insurance policy to ensure that all the parties are who they say they are, number one, and number two, that all the parties that are involved, uh, respective of ownership, that is to say the sellers themselves, uh, all actually own the house and have been uh, and, and have been legally in possession <coughs> of the house for a certain period of time. I screwed that up a little bit, so let me try it again. Okay. Basically, what title insurance says is we are going to search all the records any, uh, for anything related to the ownership of the house. And if we find any inconsistency or we find that there's any kind of a question about the uh, history of the title, uh, history of the ownership of that house, we're going to, number one, tell you, and then we have to address that problem. But if we don't find anything and actually you get the house and then for some reason on down the line, there's a question about whether the person that owned it before you actually owned it, we're going to ensure that we protect you and pay for uh, any damages or any particular lawsuit that may come your way as a result of that person, uh, of a, as a result of our research that may have been inadequate or of a fact that we didn't know about, or something else. Uh, and the reason for that obvious, is obvious. Not everybody can know everything absolutely at all times, no matter what. And it's pretty rare that it happens, but it does happen. But nonetheless, even though, you, uh, even though there may be a question as to whether you should have gotten ownership, you own that property. Okay? So that's a little bit about, uh, about title. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, let's see, I want to read my notes here. Uh, okay, I think I mentioned it already, covered it. So, uh, if you, anybody have any questions? One of these days someone's going to get a coffee bean card? Or is anything here? <laughs> okay. Dying for that first question. You know, we've been doing this blog for seven weeks now, and it's been an awful lot of fun for me. Uh, and I realize that, um, and for those of you who don't know, it's pretty rare to actually have an audience in Facebook Live. It's actually something that is taped, and you can ask questions later. So let me make that abundantly clear. Even though I'm live now, please, below um, the... Uh, comment area here. You can ask questions even if I, you're seeing this being taped and I'm happy to answer them and I'm happy to get into detail about that particular subject. So I'm going to sign off today a little earlier uh, since I'm not getting any questions. Give me a question please uh, and hope to see you next time. Before I go off the air though one more thing. Please uh, take advantage of our app 
that allows you, the Fournier app that allows you to take a picture of any house in America um, and gives you the value, tells you whether there's an open house, gives you the, the listing history of the house. Uh, I believe it has a plat map. Uh, it also allows for you to see the value of the other houses adjacent to that house or house in any neighborhood um, just by taking a picture of that particular house, literally driving down the street and you take a picture and you'll find out a lot about that house. If it's for sale, obviously everything about the sale at that house will be listed as well. But again, as I said, it'll also give you the uh, information about the houses in the area next door or around, uh, whether there's open houses, and actually will give you a marketing analysis, what we call a CMA, Comparative Market Analysis, of that particular uh, neighborhood. <clears throat> there is, you can get a real snapshot of the value <clears throat> of that particular neighborhood. And even more importantly is your ability, <clears throat> excuse me, to contact Randy and I as you're actually taking the picture itself. Uh, we won't be able to see that you're actually using the app itself. However, if you ask us a question, or there's a, a real time uh, section on the app itself. We get it right away. We can talk to you immediately about that particular house. Um, it's a much, much more accurate uh, uh, app in terms of estimating what a particular house is valued at. I don't know if I mentioned that in the beginning, but once you take the picture, the first thing you get is the actual value of that house. And it's much, much better than Zillow or any other uh, organization that is sort of third party. And the reason for that is that the app itself is directly connected as a result of being a part of our association rather than being an outside vendor. So you get a much more accurate account of um, the, the estimate on that. So please feel free to use that. Um, we are going to also uh, give you a, uh, let's see, is it here? Where is it? Take that off. Yeah. Can't find it. I always get nervous at this part. There you go. <laughs> We're going to give you a coffee bean card if you download the app. Now, downloading the app is no big deal. What, what we do is we'll give you a, a, a lead-in page where you just put your email address in, and then it does the rest. It downloads right on your phone, and you have this great app. All right. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the comment section, number one. Number two, if you have a subject that you'd like me to tear apart and explain on this particular blog, please feel free to do that. I'm happy to do that. I'm um, excited to do that. So again, we do this every uh, Tuesday at 10 a.m., 10 o'clock Tuesdays, and we'll see you next time, everyone. Bye-bye.